All right, this lecture is going to focus on elastic moduli for soil. Uh, it's a pretty important topic because we need to understand the way that the soil behaves uh, from an elastic perspective, but soil is not really elastic, so we'll talk about that too, but we still need to understand its elastic properties. So many materials are characterized by elastic moduli. Uh, most commonly, we'll use the um, Young's modulus E right here, and uh, Poisson's ratio nu, Greek letter nu. Okay, and if the material is elastic, isotropic, that's all that you need to know. Just those two material constants is adequate to fully characterize the stress strain behavior of the soil. Uh, you can calculate other moduli from these. So the Young's modulus characterizes the stress strain behavior for, you know, vertical loading. Like if we do a triaxial test where the horizontal pressure stays the same and the vertical pressure increases, the relationship between vertical stress and vertical strain is controlled by Young's modulus. If we do a simple shear test where we're loading the soil differently, Young's modulus isn't the modulus we need to use anymore. That would be the shear modulus G, right? So we can calculate G if we know E and nu. G is just equal to E over 2 times 1 plus nu, and that's the shear modulus. And now if we do that simple shear test where we have some, you know, vertical and horizontal stresses, and then we add a shear stress to it on horizontal and vertical planes, the relationship between the... Um, the shear strain, actually I've got a little mistake in here, I wanted to call this uh, gamma. So gamma is dz, where u is horizontal displacement, right? So the shear stress, sigma xz, is equal to g times gamma. Now we've got the, the correct modulus here, g, for us to characterize this loading behavior. So um, sometimes we need to do these transformations to get the correct modulus. Again, it would be different if we were looking at bulk modulus or constrained modulus. That would be like a, a consolidation test, right, where we're vertically loading it and there's vertical strain, but there's no horizontal strain. So we need to understand the boundary conditions to pick the right modulus. But if the material is elastic and isotropic, we only need two constants. So here's a question. Does soil exhibit elastic behavior? Uh, the answer is generally no, but also yes. So it's, it's both things depending on what you mean when you ask the question, does soil exhibit elastic behavior? So let's take a look at this, um, this little snowman experiment here. We have two spheres stacked on top of each other, and uh, there's some vertical force that's resulting in, in a contact pressure between these two elastic spheres. So these are deformable bodies, purely elastic. And then we add shear forces to them, T, right? So now we're pushing the spheres vertically and giving them some shear. And Mendelin was the first to solve this problem. Um, it, it turns out when you oppose the vertical forces, assuming the spheres can perfectly balance, right? That would be really kind of a difficult thing to do, but if you could balance these two spheres perfectly on top of each other and push vertically on them, uh, there would be some circular contact area. And that's shown right here, right? The two spheres kind of deform, so the vertical force is spread out over some area, and then you get a distribution of contact pressure. That contact pressure is big in the middle, right here, and then it's zero at the edges, right? We eventually get to a point where there's separation and there's no more contact pressure anymore. Now, it turns out, as soon as you impose any shear on these spheres, after they've already been kind of compressed against each other, Slip happens right at this interface, right at the edges, all right, where there's no vertical pressure. The two spheres slip relative to each other. <clears throat> so you get this kind of annular ring of slip where the two spheres have now, um, they've both deformed elastically, but they've also started to slip relative to each other. And that slip is irrecoverable, right? If you unload, you're, it's not going to slip right back to where it was before. So that's plastic. Right? Plastic means irrecoverable, so something permanent has changed now between these two spheres. So these spheres are a pretty good analog for soil. Right? Soil is a particulate material. It's not really a continuum, um, you know, whereas when we think of steel, it's, it's like continuum. It's a bulk material, right? We can easily model it as a continuum. 
It turns out if you look closely enough at any material, it's no longer a continuum, right? You get close enough to steel, you start seeing individual atoms and things like that, and it's not going to behave as a continuum at some level. So the question of whether a material is or is not a continuum really is a question of whether we can accurately model it as a continuum, because no material is truly a continuum. So if the individual soil particles are really small relative to the loading that we're imposing on it, yeah, we can model it as a continuum. But that continuum behavior is never going to be purely elastic, right? Because we basically have a bunch of particles, like spheres, all stacked on top of each other, arranged in some way. And as soon as we impose any shear on that material, it's going to exhibit some nonlinear plastic behavior. So plastic deformation um, occurs even at very small shear strengths. It's, it, soil is never really truly purely elastic. But that doesn't mean that elastic deformation doesn't exist. It just means that it never exists by itself. All right. So um, actually, deformations are uh, plastic deformations are superposed on the elastic deformation. So the resulting behavior, you know, if we go back to these spheres, the resulting behavior is a combination of the deformation of the sphere itself, like it's going to deform in some way, and then there's going to be some slip. So the overall displacement or deformation of the body is going to be part elastic and part plastic. Same thing for soil. There is elastic deformation, it's just that it's superposed on plastic deformation. So it exists, just never by itself, and our goal is to try and back out what that elastic behavior is. Because if we need to know how the overall body of soil is going to deform, we need to know its elastic deformation properties. So here, here's an example, right? Tau versus gamma. If we did a simple shear test on soil, the initial slope would be shear modulus, g. So we have that black line right there. That's the stress strain, the elastic slope. But of course, the real behavior is not going to follow that line. It's going to follow some other line that goes lower because we're getting plastic deformations superposed on top of the elastic deformations. So the elastic shear strain would be this part, right, from zero up to some point, and then the plastic shear strain is the other part that goes from the elastic line over to the actual stress strain curve. So let's talk about how we measure elastic properties, or try to measure elastic properties. So w one way is to try and do this in the laboratory. Right? We have triaxial compression tests, we have direct simple shear tests, there's all sorts of different tests that we can do, and we can measure stress strain behavior. Well, if we can get small enough, right, maybe down in this region, right, the uh, difference between the, you know, the plastic strain is small and the elastic strain is pretty big. So if we can get into the really small strain region, basically the material is behaving in an elastic way. We know it's not purely elastic, but the plastic contribution is small. So what we do is try and run tests at very small strains, generally cyclic, right? So we would, you know, run a loop and it goes up to some pretty small strain and then comes back down and then goes back up. And I'm, I'm drawing it on purpose to where it's not all along one line. There's some area underneath that curve that's due to plastic deformation, right? We are dissipating some energy. Uh, if it truly was elastic, it would follow the line and it would all be along the E line. But anyway, the slope of this curve can be pretty close to Young's modulus as long as we're in the really small strain region. Similarly, we could do a direct simple shear test here, try and keep the strains tiny, right? Very, very small strains, and then measure the slope, and that's the shear modulus. Now, the problem with doing this is that it's really difficult to make measurements at adequately small strains. Um, so here's a, here's a plot. This is shear modulus versus strain amplitude. So if we imagine we ran the simple shear test here, and we kept increasing the cyclic strain amplitude with each loading cycle, right? This, you know, the material behavior would eventually soften over here, and the, the modulus would be that, and then we would have, you know, a reduction in modulus as strain amplitude increases. So this is the modulus reduction curve, G versus gamma, and the modulus will reduce as gamma increases. Now, typical lab devices that we use commonly uh, can't measure strains smaller than about 0.01%. So I'm drawing that boundary right here. And you can see that there's already quite a bit of reduction in shear modulus that's happened. So uh, we can't really get this region from typical laboratory testing devices. Um, 
Now, Professor Vucetic at UCLA made um, a lot of uh, contributions in this area. He invented laboratory testing devices that can get down into this region and actually measure the small spring properties of soil. So um, it is possible, it's just not common to have devices that are that good. And the reason is that, you know, devices often have um, bearings, so you're pushing vertically and then you're pushing horizontally too, and the bearings have some friction and you're measuring a combination of soil behavior and device behavior and separating those things out at really small strain is very difficult. So um, anyway, lab testing can get you some information. Generally, it can't get you all the way down to the small strain behavior. So let's talk about field geophysical methods. Uh, what we do here is propagate waves through the soil and measure the vibrations. So we're not trying to measure directly load and displacement anymore. We're measuring the amplitude and more importantly, the time it takes for a wave to propagate through the soil. And the waves that we propagate through the soil have very small amplitude. So we wouldn't be able to measure the strain if we had like a strain gauge or something like that, very small. But we can measure velocity or acceleration, right? Because you can feel vibrations, but the, you know, the ground isn't really moving all that much. Um, and so there are different ways that we can propagate these waves. I think that maybe the clearest one is the cross hole method, which I have a sketch of here. That's where we drill two boreholes, or actually um, it's better to have three boreholes for a reason I'll explain in just a second. And in one of those boreholes, we put a source. So that's like a hammer that can boom, hit, and it propagates shear waves horizontally. So the source has a vertical thump, and it, it moves the soil particles in an up and down direction, and the shear wave propagates through. And then in an adjacent borehole, we measure those vibrations using a receiver. And then if you plot, it, well, you have to synchronize the receiver to the source. So as soon as the source hits, the receiver is triggered. And then you're measuring how long it takes for the wave to propagate from the source to the receiver. You might get a plot that looks something like this over here. So we have the receiver signal. This could be velocity, it could be acceleration. Um, but anyway, we plot that versus time and nothing happens for a while and then boom, the wave arrives, right? And we see all those little wiggles coming in like that. That's the ground vibration happening. Then what we have to do is interpret how long it took that wave to get there. That's called the travel time. And um, you could pick the travel time. You have to make a pick, right? You have this, these oscillations. So where did the wave arrive? Was it right there? Was it the very first time that the, the signal started moving up and down? Generally not. Uh, there's different kinds of waves that get propagated. The first arrival is usually controlled by P waves or compression waves that go faster than shear waves. So we need to separate out the shear wave part and figure out when to make an appropriate pick. A lot of people pick the uh, zero crossing after the first little peak, like right there, and that's the travel time. Then we can measure the shear wave velocity here, right? It's the distance between the source and the receiver divided by the travel time, and that's V sub S, shear wave velocity. And the shear wave velocity is important because we can directly compute shear modulus from it, right? G, the shear modulus, is equal to rho times Vs squared, where uh, rho is the mass density. I didn't write that in, I add that here. Rho equals mass density. Okay, and if we have rho in units of megagrams per meter cubed, a lot of soil is about 1.8 or 2 megagrams per meter cubed, and Vs is in meters per second squared, we end up with G in kPa, right? So those are the units that I prefer to use, but you know, you can work out the units. It's pretty straightforward to figure out what units you're working with. All right, now the problem with having a single receiver is that it's hard to make that travel time pick. Right? If you had another borehole, say you came in and drilled a borehole here, right, and put another receiver right in here, a little bit of a messy drawing now. Uh, okay, and let me actually, let me make this receiver green. Now what you would have is a blue received signal and then a green one that comes later, and the green one would look a lot like the blue one, right, maybe a little lower amplitude because the uh, the waves attenuate with distance. But uh, now you don't have to worry about like, oh, where do I make this travel time pick on the recorded signal? Because what you can do is look at this distance. 
right? That distance right there. That's a better measure of travel time. Or maybe you could look at this distance. You just pick two features of the received signals that are similar and you can make the travel time pick better. Or you could even use a cross-correlation method where you cross-correlate the two signals and figure out how far you have to shift them relative to each other to maximize the correlation between them. So oftentimes it's done with two receivers and one source, but then you need three boreholes. It gets to be expensive. Uh, okay, there are other methods. I'm not going to go through all of the geophysical methods that exist, um, but the downhole method is another common one. Uh, here it is. And this is commonly done using cone penetration test equipment now because the CPT probe has a geophone in the bottom. So the way that that works is that we park the cone truck on a, on a beam, like an I-beam here, it's coupled with the ground really well. Then we just whack it with a sledgehammer. And that sledgehammer has a little wire on it and we can trigger the data acquisition system so that we know that the receiver is going to start recording a signal. And it propagates a shear wave down because we've just hit it horizontally. Right, so we, you want to be careful to propagate the right kind of wave. We hit horizontally, the soil particles are moving horizontal and we get a shear wave. And then we measure the travel time. And so you would repeat this at a whole bunch of different depths as the cone's being pushed down. And then the slope of the travel time versus depth plot tells you something about the shear wave velocity and the layering. Uh, okay, so the crosshole and downhole methods are invasive, which means that we need a borehole or we need to push a cone into the ground. Crosshole can be done with cones too, but you need multiple cone rigs, so it gets to be a little bit uh, um, complicated too. Um, sometimes we don't want to do a, a, an invasive method, we want to do something non-invasive. And there are surface wave methods that I'm showing here. And what we do in a surface wave method is we just have a vibration source, so it's a vertical shaker, um, and we can control the frequency of the vibration. So there's a mass here and we drive it with some kind of function generator and make it vibrate at different frequencies. And then we put receivers on the ground surface. And those receivers are spaced out at some distance from the source. And then we actually vary that spacing. So if we're doing low frequency, we have to put the receivers pretty far apart because low frequency produces a long wavelength, right? That's the wavelength right there. Um, low frequency waves will have really long wavelength, high frequency waves have shorter wavelengths, so we want to space the receivers close for high frequency, far apart for low frequency. And the kind of wave that this generates is a surface wave. It's not a shear wave. A shear wave is a body wave. This is now um, a wave that is called a Rayleigh wave, and it's actually kind of similar to the wave that you would get if you tossed a stone into a calm pond. And you can see those concentric circles move away from the place where the stone entered the pond. Um, the only difference is that that kind of wave in water is propagating in a material with no shear modulus. Now this is soil, it does have a shear modulus. That's in fact what we're trying to measure. All right, so now we're measuring the speed that the Rayleigh wave travels. and. Um, Rayleigh wave speed and shear wave velocity are actually pretty close to each other. Uh, it depends only on Poisson's ratio. So if we know the Rayleigh wave velocity and we can make a reasonable estimate of Poisson's ratio, we can easily calculate shear wave velocity. Uh, okay, now you may be asking, well, how do we understand, you know, maybe there's layering down there, right? There might be like a soft soil layer on top of a stiffer soil layer. How can we use surface wave methods to, to get at that? Well, it turns out that the long wavelengths are going deeper. They're mobilizing deeper soil layers. So if we have the case where shear wave velocity is increasing with depth, the low frequency waves travel faster because they were traveling through a mix of materials that consists of the soft material at the surface and deeper, material, deeper soils that are stiffer. When we're doing high frequency, those waves are just propagating in the soft layers at the top. So what we end up doing is plotting Rayleigh wave speed versus frequency and then we can get an indication of the soil layering through an inversion process. So it's pretty cool. It's, um, it can be a lot cheaper than doing invasive methods, but that interpretation requires some expertise, right, to get the inversion. So uh, anyway, surface wave methods are becoming far more popular, uh, but we still do a mix of all these different kinds of methods. All right, now the last thing I want to talk about is um, the dependence of elastic moduli on effective stress. So we've been talking about them just as constants so far. For soil, they're not constants. Uh, if you plot shear wave velocity versus, well, this would be um, 
speck of stress, but basically it's depth, right? So you could think of this as being depth too. If you plot shear wave velocity versus vertical effective stress, and this one's normalized by atmospheric pressure, you would get a trend, right? You would not get a straight constant shear wave velocity. It would increase with depth because as we increase the confining pressure, the soil becomes stiffer, the waves travel faster through it. So what would be nice is to come up with a constant. Like let's say this is a uniform soil layer. Can we characterize this curve by sort of subtracting out that low frequency trend and detrending the data and defining a constant in, in the process. Well, we can do that. Actually, it takes two constants. So um, here's an equation that commonly is used to represent shear wave velocity as a function of effective stress. So Vs is the shear wave velocity at some depth or at some effective stress level. Vs1 is a material constant. So Vs1 is an overburden corrected Vs value it's equal to the shear wave velocity when the effective stress is one atmospheric pressure, or 101.325 kPa. Um, and then we have an effective stress term here, dimensionless effective stress, and an exponent up on top. Right? So uh, we have two new constants now, Vs1 and M. And if we know those two constants, we can calculate shear wave velocity for any effective stress level. Um, so the M value is um, generally around 0.25 for sand and 0.5 for clay. So that'll control kind of how the shape of the curve looks. And then Vs1 is the overburden corrected shear wave velocity. If we're talking about sand, Vs1 might just be a function of relative density. If you have a high relative density soil, it's pretty dense. You might have Vs1 up around three or 400 meters per second. If it's really loose sand, maybe it's down at around 100 meters per second. So those are kind of some numbers to um, to put it in context. Anyway, that's about that's elastic properties of soil. There's a lot more to it than this, but that's just kind of a brief introduction.